Thank you. Okay, So let see me you just... on the way. Thank you very much, Raj. Um, and thank you, Dr. Bamforth. That was really interesting. Um, really valuable uh, from a, a proper academic, not a doctor like me aping proper academics, which is what tends to happen. Raj, can you just tell me if you can see that okay? Yeah, yeah, we could see that. We Yeah. could see that. Great. So uh, I'll jump straight in and then we can... Uh, hopefully have plenty of time for some questions at the end. So this this will be a, a pace, but the slides are obviously there. So I've been asked to talk to everybody about mentorship and collaboration in research. Dr. Bamford has given you a really good primer, I think, in what research actually is and what it might look like and why it's important, which actually means that I can skip some of my bits because I've done it worse and then focus on some of the different things. So Uh, who am I and why should you care? I did an undergraduate degree in cellular and molecular biology at Newcastle University in 20, graduated in 2017. I, I'm not sure if this track still exists actually, but C1, C7 track. Uh, and that actually included a summer research internship. Speaking of wet and damp lab stuff, Uh, doing the iGEM, the Genetically Engineered Machine Synthetic Biology Competition I did while I was there. Then went to medical school uh, down in the Midlands at the University of Warwick, did that four-year program, and then I came all the way back up to Newcastle to do an academic foundation program at the RBI, and that was themed in what's called clinical education research. So while I was working clinically for two years, I had dedicated academic time to spend doing educational research. It's a bit of teaching, a bit of education. And I'll talk more about that in a minute, but that was proper educational qualitative research methodologies. So I then did two years doing that. I then went and spent a year down at Queen's Square, which is the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery in London. I was employed as a, uh, a Weiss Institute Research Fellow, so that's the Wellcome Trust funding activity specifically in AI and surgical robotics. So I was 20% funded for one day a week academic, uh, specifically to do simulation research for uh, neurosurgical trainees. And currently I'm working non-clinically, so I'm what's called a, a National Medical Director's Clinical Fellow, which is a leadership and management role. while I apply for neurosurgical training, which is uh, interesting. So on the left, uh, that's my first day at medical school. And on the right, that was me on Saturday, a lot, well, a bit older, a lot bolder and more tired than I probably was then. So this is the key that I want to get out of this. What is mentorship and why does it matter? Um, there are maybe some faces on there that, Some of you might recognize, I don't know, but a lot of them are Newcastle based if um, if you're based there. So if you recognize any faces, please do put them in the chat and there might be some prizes. Um, but the point that I want to get out of this slide is that everyone I've put on here, and it's completely non-exhaustive, has been a mentor to me in some way. I've had the mentorship relationship with them, and that's what it is. I think it's It's about a, it's not just a job. You don't really employ someone as a mentor, although a lot, a lot of these people I do and did work for. Um, so uh, let's pick some names. I talked about Prof Vance um, on the left-hand side there, the professor of uh, education research at Newcastle University. Underneath her, there is Mr. Marcus, an academic neurosurgeon. Uh, who else is there? Dr. Williams, Tim Williams, uh, one of the consultant neurologists at the RVI. It's over on the right-hand side. Some of these people I've worked for, some of these people I've worked not directly for, but sort of for some of these people, my colleagues are at the same stage as me, but they've, they've taught me things that I didn't know. And that to me is, is what mentorship is all about i think it's about identifying someone from which you can learn 
And that can be anything. It can be clinically, it can be academically, it can be managerially, it can be personally. But it's about about a two-way relationship that is about imparting knowledge. Um, and why that's so important essentially is it, is it fosters a particular learning process in which you you implicitly trust the other person is doing it for your benefit. I think for me, that's the other part of the process. It's not transactional. It's true investment in someone or in each other. So one of the big questions that then comes about is how do I find a mentor? And this is really hard. I think a lot of the time it's completely, as we say, serendipitous. You end up with a mentor just through stochastic processes. And the problem is with that is in that as much as I think it's true, that's not very helpful because what people want to know is how do I find that person that will invest in me and help me learn and help make me better? So how can you make your own luck? How can you stack the deck in your favor to make it more likely that you might find that mentorship figure? The first thing to say is looking for people with shared interests. People enjoy talking about the things that interest them. I like talking about neurosurgery. Other people like talking about CAR T cells, one of the most enthusiastic researchers I've ever spoken to, spent half an hour talking to me about her favorite type of T cell. Uh, but go to where the people that are interested in the same things are. So if you're looking for clinical support, go to the department. If you're looking for academic support, go to the university. If you're looking for, again, something else, uh, go to where the people are or make contact with them. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. Uh, as a secondary element to that comes attending conferences, going to seminars, going to workshops, your role here tonight, because you want to learn a bit more about research, um, what it is, how to get involved. And that's great. You've done exactly the right thing because I'm here, Dr. Bamford is here, Raj is here. You're, you're all here to help each other if you decide to make connections tonight. And that's great. Um, be keen, be seen, be proactive and get involved. I'm referencing that in a clinical sense. So if you're on your clinical placement or you're doing an elective, you need to be getting stuck in and showing that you're interested and engaged because that's how you get investment back. People aren't going to invest in someone that they don't think is invested in what they're doing. Don't be afraid to overstep with a bit of tact. Um, all I mean is you need to put yourself out there because opportunities will very rarely come to you. You have to pursue these things. So Dr. Bamforth was talking about the MRES, and obviously that's a step that you have to decide to take if it's the right thing for your career. And then if you want things on top of that, you want to do a particular type of experiment or you want to get funding or you want to connect with a particular supervisor you've got to do that. And that means maybe stepping outside your comfort zone a bit and saying, this is something that I want. I am going to pursue this. And that's the right thing to do. Be persistent, because again, this is about investment and sticking through uh, with challenges. And the final thing that I want to say here, and this happened to, to a friend of mine recently, is that you might be dead set on doing a project with a particular academic or a particular consultant. And someone came to me literally yesterday, uh, someone else in, in the research group I work for and said, like, Ollie, I've got this idea for a project. Um, would you be willing to supervise me? Uh, lots of other people have said that they don't have capacity. And so now I've come to you, who clearly not busy at all. Um, and I unfortunately had to say the same thing. Look, I'm I'm really sorry. I think it's a great idea, but I don't have the capacity right now. And that's okay. That's not saying I don't want to work with you or your idea is bad or you're not worthy of investment. But this is a really key part of communications when it comes to working on other people with research is what capacity do you actually have? How much time can you devote to a project? And if you don't have 
time. I would much rather find that out at the beginning than be constantly chasing you forever and never managing to meet you because that's a recipe for a bad project. So how might you reach out to someone? This is, again, it's, it's a little bit cringeworthy, but just, just do it. Just be polite. It's very rare that people are going to chew your head off. Um, get people's titles right. That's probably one of the givens. Spell their name right. Use their correct title. But, you know, hi, Dr. So-and-so, Dr. Bamforth. My name's Ollie. I'm a fifth-year medical student at Newcastle. I'm really interested in X, Y, Z. And that's what you do. Um, and I'm thinking about it as a potential career. I happen to be reading one of your papers. Would we be able to maybe to have a meet and have a chat? Would I be able to spend some time maybe observing in clinic if you're interested in heart failure or diabetes or something? Or, you know, I hang around with neurosurgeons. Would you mind if I shadowed you if I came to a list and watched an ECDF or something? Um, and when I stop presenting, I'll check with Dr. Bamforth and get a sense check on whether my email would land well with him or not. So what is a research group? I just mentioned that. What a research group is, is a team of people working together with lots of different skills. Um, if you've ever watched any of like the Oceans films or something like that, when you've got all of these different people working together on something really convoluted, a research group needs lots of different people, lots of different personalities for it to flow really well. Um, you know, these are just some examples. This isn't exhausted, but uh, you'll have the idea guy who's like constantly churning stuff out, but then never properly commits to any of them. And then 90% of them never get done. And I must say, I'm very guilty of being this guy. You might have a quant, um, your, your financial analyst, but your stats person, um, these are really good. If you find one of these, you hang on to them and you do not let them go because good ones are really, really rare and every research group needs them so they can tell the others when their stats aren't good because a lot of research lives or dies by statistical processing. You need someone that can write um, and it doesn't just have to be writing. If you write a blog or you write essays or you read a lot, that's a really valuable skill because writing a paper is really hard. And then you might have a graphics person, someone that makes pretty pictures that sells your work to people in the real world because 95, well, probably more than that, 99% of the people that you tell about your work won't care. It's just a fact of life um, because we do the things that we find interesting. And then of that 1%, they're probably not going to read your whole paper. They want to know what's the really important bit. So graphics, videos, posters, other things to digest it, uh, to help digest it, are vital. So it's a group of like-minded individuals. You can join one that already exists. Um, you could form your own. You know, there are loads of people here today. Go and form a new research group. Uh, you know, there's chats open. Make those connections tonight. These groups tend to meet consistently, maybe once a week, once every fortnight, regularly, with roles defined based on the strengths that you have. A crucial part of this is that one person's success is everyone's success. So it's by working together, you produce more output that is really high quality. You're not competing against each other for grants and things like it's all about everyone as a unit working together. And it's all about knowledge sharing and sharing, even in skill building. And then once you've done that, uh, pardon me, as Dr. Bamford says, you've then got to actually tell the world. So that's writing it up, submitting it to a journal, presenting it at a conference, going and doing a workshop, pitch to a conference and say, hey, um, you know, conference in neurosurgery. I've come up with this really cool simulator and I've got it validated. Can I have a workshop stand to have people come and try my thing? Or I've developed a, a board game to help get people into research and teach them critical skills. Can I have some space and have people come play my thing? Um, 
and disseminating on social media as well. Like be bullish when it comes to telling the world about the work you're doing, because it's a really competitive space and otherwise they're not going to know. Uh, I'll try and wrap up in the next couple of minutes, but you can do all sorts. And these are just some examples as Dr. Bamford was talking about dry, wet lab, systematic reviews, all of these different things. These are some papers of mine from the last few years. It's all over the place. Not, not all of it is research. Some of it is commentary pieces. Some of it is commissioned editorial. Some of it is systematic review. We did one on retrosigmoid approaches to um, vestibular schwannoma surgery. Uh, there's some proper AI deep learning uh, force sensing. So we got people to wear a glove that measured the forces through their fingers while they were performing microsurgery. You can do so much in whatever area interests you, and it's all valuable because you'll develop different skills. Uh, so what do we have? This is me presenting a poster back in, when was this? August at the Edinburgh Festival of Anesthesia. This was for a quality improvement project, an audit that we did at the Neurosurgical Hospital. And again, it means nothing if you don't go and tell the world about it. So go, go to an anesthetics conference and tell them about your neurosurgical project because they'll they'll want to know about it. And then uh, this is Mr. Ko, um, who was presenting some of our work on uh, neurosurgical simulation at the Ideal Collaboration down in London earlier this year. Uh, so just to give the point, an oral presentation in front of a group of people. Some tips for writing a good paper, keep it concise, keep it simple, stupid. Have a journal in mind before you start writing so that you can format it for that journal. It should be about clarity, relevance. What is the problem we're trying to solve here? How have we solved it? What does this mean in terms of what we already know in the research space and where do we go next? You don't really need to do any more than that. Constant feedback by elevating up the chain of command every time you have a full revision. Have a supervisor that you trust to give you really good feedback. Um, and shoot for the moon. Shoot for good journals, good conferences. And you can always come down the list if you need to. And you should start that conference submission process early. You don't need all your data. It doesn't have to be finished to give a good presentation. It's, it's more about telling the world what you've done. Uh, and because you're writing academic stuff, afraid to receive feedback like this, this is uh, a fantastic little view of what the academic feedback process is like. I've got a couple of papers undergoing review at the moment, and reviewer two will, will just bother you out of nowhere and send you a load of revisions. So thank you very much. I'm going to stop sharing my slides. There's my email address there. And uh, there's a few minutes for questions, hopefully.